just for us. Don't forgive us all, speaking your hands and not your face. Come and empty us, Father, we're desperate in this place. Holy Spirit, fill us with your fire. Give us It's a great truth, isn't it? My, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, we started this morning in the first service looking at the Sermon on the Mount. And if you're interested in outlines, which you may not be, which is fine, uh, we are stating that verse 3 down through verse uh, 12, which is the Beatitudes, we're labeling that the formation of the kingdom. Because it's there that he presents this phenomenal idea of the kingdom itself. Uh, we noted that in verse 3, which is the first beatitude, he brings up the subject of the kingdom. And in verse 10, the last of the, uh, the last beatitude, he brings up the subject of the kingdom. Doesn't mention it in between, but everything points to that. So he begins and ends the beatitudes with this kingdom concept. And the reality of the kingdom is what this whole thing is all about as Jesus preached it and is presenting it to us again. Tonight we want to move into verse 13, and you realize we're just scanning, we're just kind of skimming across the surface of things, but in verse 13, uh, down through verse 16, he gives the second section of this chapter 5, which is the second idea. He gives the premise, the formation of the kingdom in the Beatitudes, and then he moves into this section, which we're calling the function of the kingdom. The idea is, how does it work on the street? You've given this big premise, that's, go, that's good. How does that operate out here on the street? How does the everyday life, how does this affect my everyday life, my relationship with my wife? Uh, how does this flow into my business? How, how does this, what is this, how does this appear? How does it flesh out? And here's what he says, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, 
nor do they light a candle or a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. If you're going to understand the uh, kingdom concept that, he is, that Jesus is presenting in the Sermon on the Mount and Matthew is highlighting in the entirety of his gospel, uh, you've got to unlearn the kingdom concept that your culture has taught you. And that's very difficult. I know that. I've struggled with it in my own life. In our culture, we have an idea of the kingdom. We have a thought process. We have a view. And so when a preacher stands up and talks about the kingdom of God, we see it through that perspective, the eyes of our culture and what we've always known as a kingdom. And you've got to dump that and you've got to come to a new perspective and understanding of the kingdom as it comes through the mind and the heart of Jesus as he's presenting it in the Sermon on the Mount. So it's a shift in concept. For instance, uh, I come to you and say, I am a king. You immediately will ask me questions like, uh, how big is your kingdom? Uh, how much territory do you have? Uh, how much taxation do you collect? How big is your palace? Uh, what's the population of your kingdom? So we think in our culture, in terms of kingdom, we think of span, spans, we think of, of territory, we think of how big, how much, how many, how... This is an altogether different concept, folks. Uh, Jesus says the kingdom is within you. So this is not about how many... Now, we believe in the body process that Paul talked about, that we are the body of Christ. That's no problem. We believe that. Jesus is the head. You're this finger. I'm this finger. And we all fit together. And we're the body operating as one. And that's a great concept. But the concept of the kingdom is that the whole kingdom rests right here. And I'm not a part of the kingdom. I am the kingdom. I am the kingdom person. And the whole kingdom reigns right here in my life. And the kingdom is actually an intimate relationship with the king himself who actually has come to indwell me, and I am the territory, the total territory of the kingdom itself. So it's a shift in thought process. Now, if I come to you and I say, I have a king, you are going to look at me and say, oh, where does your king live? And I'll tell you, he lives outside of town in that great big palace, 17 bathrooms. They, they have all those fences, lots of soldiers guarding. He lives in that palace and he does, he does judgment and, and rules the kingdom from that palace. Culture, cultural concept. If you say to me, well, what does your king do all day? I say, well, he sits out there in his palace and he thinks of things that he wants and programs that he has and, and projects for the kingdom and he writes them all down and he gives me things I'm supposed to do and puts it in the newspaper. Do you do what your king tells you to do? Well, kind of. <laughs> kind of. I wish I could say well. Kind of. I kind of do. But what he doesn't know won't hurt him. That's not this. See, in this, the, kingdom, the king doesn't live outside town. The kingdom lives in here. And is he telling me what to do? Not exactly. Oh, you got to get this. He doesn't exactly tell me what to do. In fact, folks, I wish he would tell me what to do. If he'd just tell me what to do, I would do it. I really would. In fact, when I was a kid, you won't believe this, but when I was a kid, I put a piece of paper on my nightstand with a pencil, got down on my knees and said, God, write it on the paper. <laughs> he never did, not one time. Because <laughs> that isn't this concept. See, that's an Old Testament concept. In the Old Testament, God's over there, and what's he doing? He's sitting on Mount Sinai, writing out on tablets of stone what I'm supposed to do. He's telling me what to do. Well, I'm trying to do it, but it's hard. I wish you wouldn't look so close. I'm working on it. Come on, back off a little. No more pressure. Hey, I'm doing the best I can. I'm only one person. I'm a human being. Come on, I've got flaws. I understand that. God, hey, don't look so close. I'm just, that's Old Testament. New Testament is a whole new deal. He isn't over there anymore. He's in here. And folks, he's not in here like he's over there. 
Well, what do you mean by that? Well, when he was over there, he was telling me what to do. Now he's come to be in here and he's telling me what to do. Well, he might as well stay over there. See, he's just changed locations. But he's still telling me what to do and I still can't do it. See, this is a whole new deal. He isn't over there anymore telling me what to do. He isn't in here telling me what to do. He has literally come in here to enhance. He's literally come in here to empower. He's literally come in here to aliven. He's literally come in here to empower. He's literally come in here not to tell me what to do, but to do it. Because what he's talking about in the premise of the Sermon on the Mount is a merger it's an intimacy of relationship. It's a oneness of coming together. It's such an, a fusion of him and myself in oneness that he, we, he and I act as one. And it's as if all the power of God is all the power that I have. It's like all that he is is all that I am. It's like his mind is my mind. I'm thinking with his thoughts now. It's like my emotions have become his emotions. His emotions have become my emotions. We are linked together. His heartbeat is my heartbeat. I'm, I'm beating with his heart. I'm feeling what he's feeling. I want what he wants because he has come to, hey, the kingdom oh, is within me. My, my son hits my daughter. I sit him down and I say, hey, we're not going to have that. You cannot, you cannot hit and if you hit, I will hit. And so there's a new rule in the house. No hitting. Because he cannot hit his sister. But folks, that isn't what I want. Just that he doesn't hit my daughter, that, his sister, that, that I don't want him to want to hit her. And I can sit over there all I want to and yell at him and say, don't, don't, don't. I'm trying. But what if, what if, what if I could move within him? What if I could go to the very heart? What if I could change the way he thinks? What if I could change the view, the perspective he has of, the, uh, of his sister? What if I could change him? What if I could cause him to cherish and to want? That's this. See, that's a whole new ball game. See, that isn't the king sitting out there who's telling me what to do. See, I don't mind having a king sitting outside of town. After all, he can control that. Hey, I need a president, a president, a president. I need a president to handle things. Let's not get into this. <laughs> bad, bad analogy. I, I need a king. I need, I need, say, I need a God to handle Mars and Jupiter. I haven't got time. So he can handle gravity, he can handle all that, he can do, he can set, he can handle the internal judgment, he can, hey, that's all in his business. But folks, I've drawn a circle around myself and hey, here, I'm going to do what I want to do. He doesn't come to my house. See, he doesn't sit down and determine what I watch on TV. See, he's out there. He, that king lives out there. He doesn't dictate to me how I spent, what, I, what kind of food I eat on my table and what I talk about and the kind of jokes I tell. But see this Jesus, what he's talking about. He's talking about God coming to live within you and coming to live within you, sharing. And do you realize this is worse than your mother going to high school with you? I mean, this is, you never have a minute's peace. Because he is merged. Now, this is the premise of the Sermon on the Mount. And we got into this this morning in verse 3. You are poor in spirit. You're absolutely helpless. Hey, if I take a knife and slice you down the middle and I go to the inner core of your life, what makes you tick, what drives you, what, what causes your attitude, your motivation, everything spills out of this core issue of your life, whatever you want to call that, heart, my, heart mind, spirit, Soul, whatever you want to call that, I don't care. But there it is. The, we are poor. Abs when I go there in your life, in my life, I am absolutely helpless. I have no resource whatsoever. Jesus says, I want you to embrace that. And in embracing that, if you will live in that helplessness, 
I'm not talking a trip to the altar and, yeah, I, I need help. I'm not talking about, well, I got some problems if you want to help me. So I'm, not, I'm not talking about Jesus being an aid to your life. I'm not talking about, I need a counselor. I really do to give me advice. I'm not talking about counseling. I'm not talking about him being your counselor. I'm not talking about him being your helper. I'm not talking about, well, I got a flat tire on the Toyota life of my being. And he, woo, 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 comes down, fetches my flat tire. Thank you, Jesus. Woo. See, that's not it. His, his, what he's presenting is, folks, this whole thing has shifted. And what we've gone from a God who's a repair kit, what we've gone from a God who gets us out of the fiery hell, what we've gone to is not a God who's telling us what to do or bossing us around. What we've gone to is a God who literally wants to go to the inner heart of the being. And if I will embrace my helplessness and literally yield to him and live within the boundaries of, don't ever get out of those boundaries. Always live in your helplessness. Don't get cocky. Don't act like you can handle it, you can't. And if I will live in my helplessness and open myself up, he will come in the immenseness of his personhood and literally invade the innermost being of my life and I will literally have the per full person of the Godhead living within my gut level, my core existence, and he will literally enhance and enlighten and empower and I will begin to have his mind. I will think like he thinks. That's his proposition. You go up to this alcoholic. I work with a lot of them. You go up to this alcoholic, you whack him on the back and say, wow, I admire you. You're so disciplined. You just make yourself drink. I can't imagine it. You just make yourself drink. You get off your job, drunk it, uh, jump in your truck, drive right down to that bar. Whoa, 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 whoa. On the weekends, you get soused every weekend. You just, how do you do that? How do you discipline yourself and make yourself? And he's going to look you right in the eye and say, what are you talking about? I can't help myself. What do you mean? I got this thing in me. I got something someplace, somewhere in the gut of my life that just drives me. And my whole life revolves around, I got to have a drink. My whole life revolves around, hey, I got to have a drink. I got to have a drink. I got to have a drink. How I spend my money determined by, I got to have a drink. How I treat my family is all about, I got to have a drink. Hey, uh, 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 my, my, my friendships are all about what? How I got to have a drink, man. I got to have a drink. How I spend my time, I got to have a drink. How I spend my weekends, I got to have a drink. Everything revolves around this thing that's captured me at the gut level of my life. I... You get down to this church, you know, whack this Christian on the back. Say, I admire you. You do? Yeah. You're so disciplined. You read the Bible, testify, come to church every service. Wow. You work for the church. How do you discipline yourself like that? He'll look you right in the eye and say, what are you talking about? I can't help myself. I got this thing inside of me. This is Jesus. He just captured me. I love him with the passion of my life. And somehow my whole heart, hey, everything revolves around him. Hey, my friendships, hey, it's all about Jesus. I go golfing, it's all about Jesus. Hey, when I go fishing, it's all about Jesus. You can't rub shoulders with me without it being about Jesus. I got this. Somehow his heart, his mind, we have become so one that my whole function of life is, I'm fused, I'm You say, as he does in here in the passage, how does that function? Isn't it interesting that he uses imagery? Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. And he uses salt and light. Why would he do that? It's imagery. See, he's trying to explain something that can't be explained. And the reason, one reason he's using salt and light is the fact that it is, it is, you can't do salt. This is not an assignment. Go out and be salt. Do salt stuff. <laughs> You're either salt or you aren't salt. See, you can't light. You either are light or you aren't light. You can't. 
It's not what you do, it, and yet there's doing involved in it. We're not against doing, but hey, it's a being state. It's an imagery concept trying to describe this, 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 this merger, this intimacy, this oneness. I really got off on that because I'm finding, ladies and gentlemen, that most of the scriptures is imagery trying to describe this new thing that has come about. <clears throat> For instance, I'm the vine, you're the branch. Now, come on, I'm not a branch. It's imagery. He's the vine, I'm the branch. And the way the branch is intertwined into the vine, they are so intimately connected. They are so intimately one. Oh, the vine is the vine and the branch is the branch. No problem about that. And the branch, but it had, the branch has the bark of the vine. The branch, hey, it looks like the vine. The branch, hey, it has the life of the vine. The branch, it bears the fruit of the vine, but it's not the vine. The vine is the vine, the branch is the branch. They're distinct, but whoa, they are so intimately connected that the life fl flow of the, of the vine flows into the branch and you cut the branch off and it's dead, man. It's dead if it isn't connected because it's the intimacy. It's the oneness. It's the flow. It's the... But I'm not a vine. I'm not a branch. That's imagery trying to describe something we can't even. Wow. Do you get that? I'm a child of God. Now, don't get upset. I'm a child of God. I'm a son of the divine. Imagery. You mean I'm not really a son? Hey, I don't know. There's a lot of father-son imagery in the scriptures. I'm not be, belittling that, demeaning that, but think that through. There's a lot of issues about father and son stuff that aren't, that aren't answered in the... For instance, if, if God is my father, who's my mother? Well, there isn't one. See, it's imagery. He's trying to say, I want to describe to you this, this business of God literally coming and l going through the pores of your skin and getting inside your flesh and literally mastering your life and you and your helplessness and him and his greatness literally coming together in some kind of overwhelming merger where a whole new creature is created and you begin to act as one, move as one, think as one. What's that like? Father, son. He's birthing you. As certainly as he dwelt in the womb of Mary, now he dwells in the womb of my soul. As certainly as his life was interacting with the life of Mary, so his life in the womb of my soul is in her. That's all imagery. Trying to describe the depth. See, this thing is so big, folks. This intimacy with God is so off the wall. What Jesus is presenting in the Sermon on the Mount is so gigantic. How are you going to? Oh, here's one. I'm the bride of Christ. That really offends my masculinity. I'm not the bride of Christ. Yes, you are. Well, it's imagery. It's the intimacy between a bride and a bridegroom on their wedding night as they cuddle in the bed and, and have pillow talk at night. And how do you describe that kind of oneness and intimacy and sexuality? And how do you... How do, you, how do you, that I could enter into such a relationship with the divine God that we have pillow talk at night and he and I are so intimately connected that everything in my life revolves around him as ever all my thought processes come back to him and I, it's imagery. Do you have that? See, that's, that's what he has for you. That's not far out. That's not, well, that's really a saint. That's normal. That's the average. Do you know what Jeremiah 31, 31 says? Oh, Jeremiah in that chapter is talking about God says, God is talking. And God says, I'm going to give a new covenant with Israel. And the old covenant is going to kind of fade. And I'm going to establish this new covenant. And he says, oh, I'm going to take the laws and I'm going to write them in your heart. And no man will need to teach another man about the Lord because we'll just all know.
Will you stall now? That, that's this. That's an intimacy that's so... See, that's an intimacy that doesn't set your son down and say, don't hit your daughter, don't hit your, your sister. That's an intimacy that crawls inside of you and I don't want to hit her anymore. See, that's a change in my whole thought process. That's a, see, this is not reform. This is not turn over a new leaf. This is not, well, get off my back. I'll go to church. See, this is not, okay, I'll read the Bible every day. Jesus wept, got that done. See, this is, this is, come on. This is, this is not that kind of, this, this is, wow. He has come. I am helpless, absolutely helpless. I admit that. And he has come in the amazing resource of his person. And somehow we have come together in such intimacy that he and I, we have become, we have been welded together. We have formed this, this, this new creature. This new creature. Now looking back at the passage, this imagery. You are the salt of the earth. Gives one verse to that. I've heard that phrase all my life, as you probably have. Hey, oh, John, yeah, John. He's a salt of the earth kind of guy. Good guy. Salt of the earth. But think about it. Salt of the earth. See, if he just said salt of the potatoes, I could have bought that. <laughs> See, salt of the, of the roast beef, I could have got into that. Salt of the earth? It's interesting that the word earth shows up three times in chapter 5. That's an interesting idea. And when you look at the soul of the earth, it's the, little, the word earth is the little word gay, G-E. It shows up in the Beatitudes. Did you note that in verse 5? It's the third Beatitude. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Isn't that interesting? It's found in the passage we're reading tonight in verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. And then if you go over to the oath example that he gives in chapter 5, that you're, uh, you're not to swear in verse 35 to take an oath, nor by the earth. What's this earth thing? Well, as found in the passage, it has the idea of the physical. The physical. See, there's the spiritual. I got that. There's the physical. We sure know about that. That all day long my life is spent on the physical. I know. There's all this physical stuff that's got to be done. Amen. There's this Saturday. You're going to do some physical stuff in the physical church for the physical appearance of the physical worship that we're going to continue to physically do in the physical Sundays that are physically going to come. See, we're really into the physical, aren't we? What takes the physical and enhances it, makes it beautiful, makes it tasteful, makes it, this is good. What does that? It's the spiritual. See, the physical was always meant to come under the authority of the spiritual. The minute that gets upside down, you're in a mess. The minute the physical begins to dictate to the spiritual, it's chaos. See, the physical is a platform upon which the spiritual acts itself out. And when the physical comes into the control of the spiritual, wow, there is such a phenomenal tastefulness, goodness, delight that takes place in the physical that we applaud it. And you know what makes my physical life enjoyable? You know what makes me feel good physically? You know what takes my physical activities and makes, I, I really like that. That was good. You know what takes the activities, the physical activities of my life and makes them a joy to participate in? It's this spiritual thing, folks. It's this merger thing. And somehow when I merged with him, somehow when he, and he's dominating the physical activities of my life. And the physical becomes a display of this merger. Wow, all the physical takes on a... It goes up a level. 
I don't think that's hard to prove to you. For instance, sexuality. What do I want? I don't want to just have sexual experience. You can hire a prostitute and have sexual experience, but that isn't satisfying. What do I want? I want love. I want companionship. I want somebody who cares. I want intimacy. I want... I want somebody who's filled with Jesus, who loves me like he does and gives their life to me. And sexuality in that context takes on a whole new, whoa. See, we could walk through every physical aspect of life. And all of physical is enhanced and becomes beautiful. When? When it's brought under the domination of the spiritual life. You are the salt. Why? Because you have entered into the merger. And in the merger, oh, your whole physical life has taken on this tone. And your attitude that's expressed in the physical. The way you drive. Oh, sorry, I brought that up. The, the whole activity of your life is somehow immers immersed in this, in, in, this, in this spiritual flow. Which brings a tastefulness. You ever think about stress? I go to the doctor. These doctors. I go to this doctor. I say, oh, pain, pain, right there. He turns to me and says, uh, how are you getting along with your wife? I say, none of your business. Bug off. I got pain right there. You got a pill? He said, you got any... You got any stress at your job? I say, come on. I didn't come for psych uh, to a psychologist. But, but see, he knows that the physical and the spiritual are so interactive that you can't... See, where does stress come from, folks? All stress. Come on. All stress comes from what? Ownership. Hey, when I, when I drove over here, I got a rental. You know how many times I checked the oil? Why? Not my car. I don't care. Amen. There is no stress. Somebody, hey, you got a flat tire. Call the rental company. See, it's all off my back. See, all ownership comes from all stress comes from ownership is there any question in your mind about that well manly i got will you pray for my kids yeah i will i'll put them on my list i'll pray for them every day okay but i'm not staying up all night why not not my kids <laughs> see when does the pressure come the pressure comes when they're mine well, what if they weren't yours? What if you could give them away? <laughs> Who wants them? Jesus does. But it's my ministry. What if it wasn't? But it's my life. What if it wasn't? But it's my problem. What if it wasn't? That's this. What if you entered into an intimacy? What if you entered into this? I'm helpless. I'm absolutely helpless. There is no chance in my life of pulling this off. I am absolutely helpless. I embrace that. He comes in the wonder of himself and literally merges with me. And it's no longer my problem. It's no longer my life. It's no longer my ministry. It's no longer my kids. It's no longer my home. It's no longer. There's something going on. It's ours. And in the midst of that, in the wonder of that, do you understand that takes the, that's the relief valve of all stress. Whew. Wow. Man, I got to have that. I got to have that. I, 
want you to look at verse 13 again. In verse 13 it says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor. That's an interesting idea. In fact, I don't know how you'll respond to this, but if you will Google salt, it will tell you that salt can never lose its flavor. It's impossible. Salt is always salt. And it's impossible for salt to lose its flavor. That what happens is salt is mixed with something else. For instance, if you take a grain of salt, it will always be salt. But when you put it in a, in, in a bowl of sugar, you no longer, its effectiveness, it's it loses its flavor in the mixture. Do you know the early church dealt with that? See, there was this move on that said, oh, Christianity is great. I know. God wants to indwell us. Wow. Fullness of the Spirit. Wonderful. Pentecost. Hallelujah. But we need to bring it in and mix it with Judaism. And all the rules and all the laws and all the ceremonies and all the activities of Judaism must be mixed with this. Do you know what that'll do to Christianity? And in the Jerusalem Council, in Acts 15, they put their foot down and say, No! No! This is a whole new deal on its own and are not mixing it with anything else. For the minute you mix it, there is a deterioration of the very effect and movement of the salt itself. And it must not be mixed. See, the minute you take, oh, mercy. The minute you take this, this intimacy with Jesus and mix it with anything else. And the devil is so slick on this, folks, in our lives. Well, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I got... And the next thing I know, my job, my home, my focus, my, it's all on. And I bring and I mix Christianity with. And it isn't that Christianity isn't involved in all of this. In fact, Christianity should be involved in all of it. But the focus of all of this somehow is his presence in the middle of all of this. And the minutes I mix it, we do that with the gifts of the spirit. We get, we get off. We, hey, miracles. Are you against miracles? No, I'm for miracles. I'll take one. In fact, I'll take several. I'm not against miracles. Who would be against miracles? You'd be an idiot to be against miracles. Does Jesus do miracles? Well, yeah. But the minute you focus on miracles instead of the end, Intimacy of relationship with him. You've got off. You've mixed it. And it deteriorates on you. Have you done that? That Christianity is just one thing among many. See, Christianity cannot. This intimacy with Jesus, this merger that we're talking about, cannot be one thing among many things in my life. It has to be the thing. Man, that's pretty radical. I know. I know. My dad taught me well. He said, Christianity is flat on the floor, third gear. You can't be kind of Christian, maybe Christian, a little Christian, some Christian, half Christian. There's no half breeds here. Get in or get out. Because that's all this will tolerate. And if you don't, you lose flavor. Now, it's really interesting that when you look at the original word that is translated, the Greek word that's translated loses its flavor. It's the Greek word moreno. It's where we get our word moron. It only shows up four times in the New Testament, four times. And in the three times, not this one, this is the fourth, but in the three times, it's translated fool every time. When it showed up here, they translated it loses its flavor. Where did they get that? Well, it's the salt illustration. How do you handle it? See, how could you translate it? You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt becomes a fool. What if that's really the truth?
I'm absolutely helpless. What if I won't embrace that? I'm not going to admit I'm helpless. I'm going to act like I'm not helpless. I am helpless, but I'm not going to act like it. Everybody else knows it, but I want to know it. I won't embrace it. You know what I have to do? I have to reach out and grab a hold of every situation, every activity, every circumstance in my life, and I have to manipulate it for myself. Why? Because I got to guard, protect. I don't have any resource. I can't. Oh, you didn't get that. Let me give it to you again. I'm absolutely helpless. What if I won't admit that? I'm not helpless. I'm going to act like I'm not. Then I have to reach out and grab a hold of every circumstance and I have to manipulate it and I have to use it and I have to compromise it and I have to, every circumstance, I've got to, I've got to, because I, I got, I'm helpless and I have to manipulate it for myself and adjust it to meet my needs. I can't spill my life out. I can't give myself out away. I can't love. Does that make sense to you? See, if I'm a billionaire and you rip me off from $10, psst, I don't care. But man, when I only got 50 bucks to my name and you rip me off $10, I got problems. See, I'm a billionaire. I can afford to love you, forgive you. I've got a resource inside of me that's so big, I can afford to just lavishly, extravagantly waste love, forgiveness, generosity, mercy, meekness, and all the aspects of the Beatitudes begin to spill into this. I'm meek. Why? Because I'm helpless and I've got a resource in me that's so big. <laughs> Woo. And I can afford, I can afford meekness. I, mercy. I can give away all the mercy. Why? Because I've got so much mercy coming into me, brother. <laughs> oh. Merger. I want this for you. <laughs> See, this is so much bigger, folks, than just, well, my name's written down in the book. And, hey, I appreciate that, but do you understand? Jesus wants to invade your life. Not touch you, not be your counselor, not give you advice. He literally wants to invade you and in the intimacy of his life and your life enhance you into the fullness of what he's dreamed you could be. Oh, Jesus, I haven't explained it well enough. Oh, would you come in the passion of your being and would you literally embrace us? Would you literally overflow upon us? Would you literally infiltrate our hearts and our minds and show us? God, we, we, all this imagery is, is an attempt to ascribe this and yet it doesn't ascribe it. We're in way over our head, God. What you want to do in us as you presented in the Sermon on the Mount, is so radical, it is so startling, the kind of relationship we could have with you. And Jesus, the beatitude, I hunger and thirst for this. I find my soul saying, oh, I want this with all my heart. I want intimacy with you. Tonight, I come back to my helplessness. Because there is absolutely no way, oh God, absolutely no way I'm going to pull this off. Absolutely no way I'm going to get this done. Absolutely no way I'm going to accomplish this. I could never, you could not give me a list of steps. I could not construct this. There's no way I could climb this mountain. But I could get on my face. And you would come and embrace me. You would come in and do in me what I cannot do. You would come and give yourself to me in a way.
heads are bowed. Everything within you tonight cries out for this. You were built for this. You were created for this. This is the single destiny of your existence. Miss this and life is chaos. Grasp this and direction will and purpose will be yours. Miss this and you'll be manipulating every circumstance in your life to gain for yourself. You'll be protecting and guarding and splitting your relationships Embrace this, and resource will be in abundance. Could you embrace your helplessness tonight? Well, I'm not bad, manly. We're not talking about that. Come on. I don't do evil things of the world. Okay, good. But woe unto us, dear friend, if we have developed a Christianity that we produce on our own. Woe be unto us if we have a righteousness that is a product of ourselves, which is filthy rags. Woe be unto us if we become the Pharisees of the church of the Nazarene that don't know the intimacy of the living Jesus. Hey, our altar's open. Maybe you can't kneel. I get that. You could come and stand. Maybe you can't stand. You could come and sit in a chair at the front. But would you respond to his call on your life. Have you mixed it? Have you had him as king, but he lived outside of town? Do you have his mind? Do you think like he thinks? Do you see like he sees? Well, I don't hit my sister. Could he do something in your heart to where you didn't want to? Hey, don't rush into this. This will cost you everything you got. This isn't casual. This isn't joining the club. This is an abandonment of your life. But then Jesus is worth it. He is worthy of it. For you are helpless. I am helpless. I got to have this in my life. I want to go deeper in this intimacy. I want all that he is in all that I am. So that I might be a physical demonstration of who he is. So our altar's open. Would you join me in seeking him again tonight?
Let's pray together. You're here. God, you're here and you're moving. I, I sense your presence. I sense your spirit. Lord, Lord, I recognize that in my life, you don't want part, you want all. Not because you need my life, but because I need your life. Lord, we get this so confused. We begin to think of you as um, a demanding king, a demanding task master, someone who just wants to take our life for the purpose of taking our life. But Lord, you don't want our life just to take our life. You want our life so you can give us life. So that our relationships can be better. So our work life can be better. So, so our church life can be better. Because you'll fill it. Lord, we hold things back from you. Will we tell you this far, but no further. And yet your invitation to us is to open up our lives completely to you so that you can merge your spirit with our spirit so that we can see things differently. We can react differently. Lord, we want to be a church. We want to be Christians who are not just Christians in, in label or by title, but your spirit has invaded our life to such an extent that people look at us and they see our Heavenly Father. Lord, I'm thankful that you continue to give opportunities to me and to those of us sitting here. You continue to give us opportunities to repent, to let go of the past, to let go of the ways that we're thinking and grab hold of the ways that you want us to think, the things you want us to see. Well, we're thankful, Lord, for your kingdom that, that can live within us. We're thankful for the promises of your word. And Lord, as we consider what Jesus has said in the Beatitudes, these aren't just ideals out there in, in the, the atmosphere that we can't live, but he's inviting us to a new way of life, a new way of living, living with each other, living with our families, living in our community. So Lord, right now I pray that um, you will take these words. And uh, Lord, tonight, as we lay our heads down on pillows, we will continue to wrestle with the ideal of whether you are really the, the Lord of our life, whether we've given you at all. Lord, as, as we go through our week and as we go through the day tomorrow, may, may our spirit be in tune with your spirit to the extent that if, if you show us areas that we're holding back, we'll respond to you. Lord, I love you. You've been good. There's never been a thing that I've given you that you've not given far more back. I don't regret one thing that I've given up for you because in you I've found life. Lord, help us to see that. Lord, too often we get confused and we begin to hold on to things that we think are better than you and they're just flat not. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We give you glory. We're thankful for our brother Jesus who came and died on a cross, who shed his blood so that we could have life. We're thankful for the giving of the Holy Spirit that animates even our presence, our spirit, even now. So help us now, Lord, just to continue to focus and listen to you even in the coming moments, hours, and days. Be with us in this revival. I believe you're trying to do something new and fresh in our church. And Lord, your move, your moves dependent on our willingness to say yes. May we be people who say yes to your spirit and to your move. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Folks, God bless.